Hello, it's Ann Teed, and I am uh, going to make some videos for student teachers or teachers in general uh, with the knowledge I've gleaned over the years being a supervisor at the college level at four different colleges and um, what I've gathered along the way in my basket of what you need to think about um, for your teaching portfolio and your resume and all that stuff that you need as you market yourself as an art educator. Um, I want, I'm going to split this up into different sections because it really, I've done seminars for this for 16 years and sometimes it might be a two hour class just on one particular thing. So uh, I'm going to split these up. The first is going to be a general overview about the professional teaching portfolio. And as a guide, I'm going to be using an article that was written, a little outdated, but I, I highlighted stuff I'm going to talk about. Uh, it was May 2011 in the Art Education Journal, NAEA Journal, and it's called Preparing a Professional Teaching Portfolio for an Art Teaching Position, and is by Melanie Buffington. And I encourage you to look this up, and I'm giving her credit, and um, I'm going to go over a couple of different things. Uh, when I found this, it was given to me at one of the particular colleges to pass out to our students. And so let's, let's go over a couple of the points. And then in my second video, I'm going to go over a rubric that I created um, years ago when I was at SUNY New Paltz. Uh, for the students to critique each other and to critique themselves about the portfolio. We've evolved into digital portfolios and, and hard copy and web designs. So some of this stuff, even though this article is a little outdated, it's still the same process of creating um, a portfolio, a professional uh, presentation of who you are as an educator. So one thing... Um, starting off on this is what is a professional teaching portfolio and um, it is a collection a very carefully selected organized collection of artifacts that show the applicants applic uh, abilities in multi facets of art education so you have to carefully select and organize these artifacts and it's evidence of your knowledge uh, your dispositions and your skills. All right, so that's just, you know, think about it. it is a tool for anybody going on a job interview. If you're an engineer, a math teacher, a nurse, or whatever, you have to go in with a body of artifacts of who you are. So, um, uh, you, especially in this day and age, uh, I want to talk about the who, what, where, when. The who could be, uh, it could be a panel of people for the district. It could be all art educators for a department if it's a larger district. It could be a principal. It could be somebody who's never uh, really had to be involved in art education. So you really need to sell it to that um, non-art educator. So keep that in mind who the who is. And uh, then there's the subdivisions of who. Is it an elementary school? Is it a middle school, high school? Is it um, in the public working in community, um, you know, university level? So the who is very important and your portfolio needs to be diverse enough that you can go in and open it up to sections that speak to that who, to that audience. All right, um, again, you know, really important. If you are gonna go into art educators who really, you know, very savvy art teachers who want the jargon and want uh, your disposition on different art education, if it's contemporary, if it's art history, then you need some of that in there too. So you need certain uh, threads throughout, but most likely it's gonna be, a, I don't know, I actually don't know of one art educator who became um, a principal or a, a supervisor of a whole school or a district. So remember that um, you're going to educate them about your discipline um, with not getting uh, really tied up in a lot of uh, jargon that uh, art educators speak, but other ones, it would leave others out. All right, um, what should be in your teaching portfolio? What does an artifact add um, 
that's not already shown. So when you're building and you're organizing this, it's important that, and we'll go over quality and all these things, that it tells a complete story but doesn't duplicate itself. So you're not saying, I love young children making art a billion times or repeat it throughout. So you have to be selective and um, make sure that you're telling this story clearly and edit. And uh, I always suggest that you get two other people to take a look and open your portfolio out and just have them go through without you talking and say, what is this, what does this section tell you about me as an educator, as an art educator, as somebody teaching, as somebody working with individuals, as somebody knowledgeable. So have them tell you, give the feedback without you saying, well, this, this lesson was about. So make sure you have those critiques and edit um, because you will not have that clear eye, all right? So that's important. You can do that with your peers within the program you're in or other art teachers, your mentor teacher, all right? Um, we're talking about hard copy right now. We'll get in later to the digital and the web and, you know, leave behind small portfolio printed out books and stuff. But um, it's really important that we're just talking about that hard copy, big book that you go into an interview with. Um, I talked about this in class the other day that this portfolio, um, the size of it, the uh, professionalism of it um, is really, really important. So don't make it too small. Um, it needs to be able to be, you know, across from somebody talking or uh, not all the time is it handed to someone and they get to look. Sometimes it's, you know, talk about this, whereas sometimes it's held up to a few individuals. So I wouldn't go too, too large. It needs to be handled and it needs not to be too, too small. All right. So that's one thing, the size of it uh, and how thick it is. Uh, that's uh, really a concern too. Many times I've, I've had portfolio classes where people have these really thick binders and the binders are coming apart because it's too jam-packed. It is better to have a few different uh, binders, folders, by subject of you know your first placement, your second placement, your personal art, special projects, then one big, big one that's too heavy and clumsy and you know, you're handing this big life story uh, over. So be sensitive to the size, be sensitive to the, the, the depth of how much, so you ha can split it up. I know that um, like Office Max and all those stores do have smaller binders that have an amount of, you know, 15, 12 pages, 15, fit, whatever. So you can buy them pre-bound that you're not using loose leaf that it can fall out. You can use loose leaf too, but make sure that it's really strong and that everything is reinforced. And you know, do you put plastic sleeves or you're not? That's up to you. Um, so figure that out. I hear some chimes. Okay, um, so again, make sure it's, it's clean cut. Uh, it is, uh, this book is a product of you collecting artifacts, organizing them, and reflecting on these. So you're going to have some commentary, too, uh, in there. You're telling this story. I've mentioned also in past videos and in classes that you may not got to get to speak at all about this portfolio. You might be sitting there and not given a chance to give your narrative, well, here I am. It might be that you're silent, they're gonna ask you questions, you open up to your book. So, and many times it's, hey, let's take a look and you're quiet as they're breezing through and they're digesting it. So don't overthink uh, that you're handing it over or that you have that chance. It needs to be self-contained, that you could leave it behind and people would have the whole story about who you are. Um, so that's really, really important. Um, so right here it says the, the longest portfolio is not necessarily always the best. And that's why I, you know, you got to be sensitive of how much you put in this. Sometimes less is better. Um, and we, you know, that audience, you, you, your time is usually very limited at a job interview too. So you, that, that first interview is with that book. You might get a second one. You might, they might ask to, for you to leave it, mm, I don't feel too comfortable with, with leaving big portfolios behind. Um, so make sure that you 
think that out. You can have a printout of a 12 page kind of, um, or a website to guide them to as well. In your portfolio, you should have the curriculum uh, supervisors that were all interviewed. This article is about hundreds and hundreds of college supervisors and people who work with student teachers or teachers entering the field or people starting a new job at teaching. And it was rated on what they found to be the most important in a teaching portfolio. So the curriculum supervisors that were interviewed for this said, the resume is 99% important in this portfolio. So you are gonna have your resume being clear cut and you're gonna have it uh, printed up and you're gonna have it one or two pages. Make sure it's, it is to the jobs that you're, you're going to. So if it's uh, special needs in art, make sure that resume is tailored. So you're gonna have many different resumes uh, focusing on the job that you're applying for, but that resume is very, very important. And we'll go into that in another video of, of how that really uh, flexes and has another representational quality. The second thing is your philosophy was 97% important to those interviewed here uh, for this research. So that teaching philosophy should be one page, should be clear cut, and uh, we'll go over that too in here of what all these people interviewing are looking for in your teaching philosophy. Images of student work, 96% important, and it's gotta be, um, a clear story, not a hundred pictures. And I am going to post uh, this article, uh, pick certain sections of it so you get an idea of how many pictures per page. Uh, you're not gonna show 37 pictures for one lesson. You're gonna take the, uh, tell the story with them and we'll go over that too. Uh, lesson plans, they need especially a principal. A principal interviewing needs to see that you know your subject, you can Keep the class orderly and everybody listening and learning. Behavior is a really big thing that your students engage. Your stories need to tell that. Your lesson plans need to show that you're asking essential questions and everybody's working hard and they're learning. And um, so, so keep in mind that, uh, that lesson plans is a very important tool because we all as teachers speak in that um, in that vein of lesson planning. We all have, depending on math, science, or whatever, it's our structure of how we say what we're gonna teach, who, the who, what, where, when. All right, the next thing is the applicant's own artwork. And that was very, very important too. It was 91%. That uh, will go over two of the do's and don'ts of it, but that was very important too. Letters of recommendation. Not as important, but still a high thing. Be gathering them during your placements. Could be a principal who came in and, and observed you informally. Um, teach professors you've had in the past. People you trust who can speak about who you are. Um, letters of recommendation, too. They're in the back. They're not profiled. Nobody's going to sit and start reading them during an interview. But you have them in the back ready to, um, to hand out if needed. Or in a separate book your leave behinds if they're, they're it doesn't have to be part of the big book. Assessment rubrics, 85% of those in this uh, research said that was important. Why? Because education is really under the microscope about how we assess. And art education, man, we are a squiggly wiggly sometimes because we're about the meaning of things and cultures. We are the history of man in visual form. And um, so it's really hard sometimes to assess but as educators, it's very important that we say this is essential of what we're teaching and this is how we're going to gauge um, how we know that the student got this. And I am going to do another whole video on assessment because there's so many ways to assess. And the arts, sometimes that rubric cuts us short, so there's many ways. And um, so if you don't catch the other video that I'm going to do, then make sure that you're looking up. There's a great book on assessment of art. Uh, I'll leave that uh, in the commentary of this too. That is like, that it's just like a golden uh, book of all the different opportunities to assess in art. All right, um, your teaching license, it's in the back. Your transcripts, 
Yeah, okay, someone might ask, or again, that's in the back or in a separate book, your classroom management plan. Mm. Sometimes, you know, I, we never even really go over this. Uh, we think of it more organic at the college level. It's integrated into your field work and into when you're in the trench with your student teachers, um, with your cooperating teachers. It's just by osmosis that we are um, developing our own management. So there really isn't this need to have a plan because it would be flexible. It would be um, for each class that you taught. All right, your credentials. Uh, resume is between one and two pages. Sharp as a tack. Um, that you really need to really show who you are of your skills and everything up front. Um, and uh, your teaching philosophy should be one page. And it should not be full of a lot of art education jargon. It should be really for that who, that principal who might not even liked art at all when they were growing up or, or really like gets really nervous when they have to work with the art teacher in their building. So, um, but also make sure that you are wording things that you know the understanding, uh, you know, the importance of art education. So if it is an art di director of the district reading it, that they um, are understanding how passionate and how dedicated you are as an art educator as well. So you're really doing both audiences, but make sure it's free of all that jargon that they were like, I don't know what the heck we're talking about. Uh, when re uh, writing your teaching philosophy, it can be a challenge. Uh, you're going to basically think about the aspects of education that are important and uh, to you and how it would show up in your classroom. That's what your teaching philosophy is. What's important to you and how would it show up in your classroom? A teaching philosophy should be relatively short, use common uh, educational language and provide concrete examples. All right, that's it. And it should be shown throughout your portfolio. Your portfolio is backing up that um, philosophy and your philosophy does go in the front all right in a, my video second video that I'm doing uh, that'll be attached to this you will see part two you will see uh, in the rubric about how to structure it the table of contents there's a table of contents in the beginning of all this right uh, so keep that in mind that there is a definite organization you should have your a lesson, your, all your lessons or your unit plans involved in your uh, teaching. It's a teaching portfolio. It's not just your art portfolio. Uh, it's really important that um, how it's been structured, most of the colleges I've worked at, is that the first uh, half of your book is your first student teaching experience. And uh, you usually pick three lessons that you do the beginning to the end story of that lesson, that grade level, what was incorporated in the learning, and the process along the way, taking pictures of the students sketching. Very important to take, have someone take pictures of you teaching because that educator in the, in the hot seat at your interview needs to visualize you being in front of the class, being the authority in the class, being benevolently giving out uh, you know, all your knowledge and nurturing all those students and keeping them engaged and listening and behaving. So um, keep that in mind. All right, um, let's see. So where am I? I lost my place, hold on for a second. Um, Okay, so the three, and we got it. So you're going to have three for your first student teaching placement. You're going to have three for your second, maybe four if it's really, you know, you, you're going to, again, not make this too, too, too lengthy. In those six, we'll say six projected lessons that are your toolbox to say, here I am as a teacher, um, they would be at different levels because K through 12 in New York State, you're going to have an elementary and then a secondary. So um, within that, make sure there's something in those six, les six lessons of multicultural, interdisciplinary, um, all, all the different things that, that are important in all the realm, contemporary art maybe, some art history, language-based in uh, 
working with other subjects. That's the interdisciplinary. So make sure that not all of them are a repetitious on a particular discipline within art education. Try to, you know, even if it was a short lesson, but it talks about uh, a culture that you're bringing arts in from different cultures, throw that in instead of if it's, um, you know, printmaking and this and that and sketching, make sure you're building those other areas of discipline in art education into those six, okay? Make sure you're also in those six lessons showing the exceptional students, and I mean by exceptional student, uh, the students who really excel and have gone beyond their peers, to the student also who needs the extra help, who might have an educational plan for their special need, and you want to show their uh, involvement in your lesson too. So it's not, oh, these are the prettiest artworks that came out of this lesson. Definitely not. It is showing your students who had needed more concrete learning, needed you to adapt the lesson, to the student who got to be uh, pushed a little bit more. Maybe they had to do some research on this project. So you always have those three audiences within your own classroom. Try to show them in your lesson planning instead of the broad, general um, take on here are the students, uh, you know, uh, output of this project. All right, so that is with, um, with the lesson planning. I'm going to uh, end this part one. I'm going to start part two and continue with this article, the professional teaching portfolio, and my, um, my guidance in this. So end of part one. See you part two.